People try to recomp, like they bulk or they cut. How many reps in reserve should I leave, if any? And my take on this is extremely simple. Really is the most underrated compound movement of all time. So I want to kick things off around 2020 when you spoke about your ideal physique. You mentioned legs and arms being important, wanting a big back and chest, but being fine with it being overpowered by your limbs. You also want to develop traps and neck with the ideal being adult gone from Hunter Hunter. First, is this still your ideal physique? And second, maybe over the last few years, tell me something that's gone better than expected and worse than expected in terms of progressing that physique. So we are jumping right into questions. That's great. Um, well, my goal physique, I've always had a few fictional characters that I look up to. So I have Guts from Berserk, I have Zod from Berserk. But for me, when I try to manifest what I want to look like in my 40s, it is adult gone, because to me, that's the perfect physique. And what immediately strikes you when you look at his body is the limbs, right? Yeah. It's massive quads, massive arms, biceps, triceps, everything. So this, this is still true to this day. It hasn't changed at all. And what I found is that for someone like me, it's very easy for my torso to overpower my limbs. If I start to really focus on horizontal presses, suddenly my chest is going to blow up out of nowhere. And it's not necessarily a bad look, but it's not one that I like. So I've always put a high priority on arm isolation because I know that even if I'm way too extreme with it, the possibility of my torso getting dwarfed by the limbs is slim to none. And even if it happens, it's very easy to correct. So that's that's always been my mentality and my mindset. And I try to tell people this because I've noticed that if you just follow the consensus of your fitness, you will end up torso dominant because you will end up focusing on the compounds and the compounds grow the torso in priority. And following this methodology, what I found surprised me positively and negatively was that on the positive side, as I said, you will never have a weak point in the muscles that you don't prioritize like the chest, unless that was already a weak point to start with. So that's not an issue. And then the negative is that I've noticed that I actually wasn't extreme enough in this mindset because stuff like the triceps, which I thought I was working enough, I've found recently that actually I wasn't doing nearly enough isolation sets because I was still thinking that presses were going to take care of it. And ever since I started really hating Stuff like GM presses, score crushers, extensions, in priority, only for triceps. Only then I've started to see growth in that area in a muscle that for a long time I thought I had bad insertions or genetics, when in reality it's just that I wasn't treating the muscle right. Yeah, that's interesting. So I know when I kind of started lifting, I worked arms really heavy. And then when I kind of got back into lifting, I started doing a lot more of the torso stuff because that's what YouTube Fitness was suggesting. That's what people in powerlifting were suggesting. And I almost was proud that I was neglecting arms. And I'd say over the last two years, I'm like, no, I'm, I'm moving it up in the workout. I'm having an arm day. I'm spending time here. And it's okay if it out overpowers it because everyone should have their own ideal physique of what they want. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's too bad that with all of the information and knowledge that comes with YouTube Fitness, also comes sadly an ide ideological vessel that people don't quite perceive, where you end up following someone else's vision, because you followed our training and you followed our programs. And so you always should take a step back and think, okay, what is this going to lead me to? And is the result physique going to be something that I like? I think that at some point or the other, past the novice stage, you should sit down and ask yourself, okay, what do I want to look like? It might sound, in a sense, stupid, but if you don't know, you'll end up with a physique that is going to just be a byproduct of whatever random stuff you're doing instead of being the vision that you had in your head. Yeah, it's really important. When I listen to your ideal physique, I agreed with a lot of uh, pieces, but I'm like, I kind of like the bolder shoulder look as well. So for me, that's a little bit more important when for you, that's less important. And that's okay, because it's my physique. Yeah, absolutely. And even that can evolve with time. I know that smaller shoulders were my thing back in the days. And now that I've started to connect with certain shoulder movements, I'm starting to want bigger shoulders, not necessarily for the look, but just because it's actually fun to train. Uh, which, uh, which lifts are you connecting with? 
So I completely removed the military press with a barbell because I found that for me, it, it always ended up being this weird, almost balance exercise where my shoulders seem to be out of it very quickly. And it's just a struggle where I can't really focus on the muscle. So now I do seated um, AD presses on the Smith and I stop at chin level. So some people like to stop at nose level, which is even less range of motion. And I found that this is incredible for shoulders. And on top of that, unlike a military press, you can do rest pose because you can just re-rack the Smith, wait 15 seconds and get additional reps that are going to be extremely intense for the shoulders. So that's one. And then lateral raises. I used to do lateral raises with dumbbells. And for me, it was traps or injuries. It was one or the other. My shoulders were doing something else. They were on vacation. Ever since I started doing cable uh, lateral raises with a cuff, it's night and day. And now I can actually fill the side delt because I can control the negative. It's, it's really difficult to control your negative on lateral raises with dumbbells because the momentum and the strength curve is all over the place. But with a cable, you can actually slowly lower the arm. And that makes all of the difference. Have you tried behind the back for the cable raises? So I tried that pretty recently. I chatted with Eric Helms and he was saying it's like his favorite exercise. And I was actually sore. Like, And I'm like, oh, I don't usually get sore for like a day after doing lateral raises. So it's that one's really clicking with me. Yeah, it, I think it's really the clicking thing that matters with lateral raises. As long as you're moving the arm in that plane of motion, you will get side dots. Then just pick whatever you like. For me, anything that puts the shoulders behind the body, unless it's a shrug, I try to avoid because I end up feeling way too much real doubt. But that could actually be a good option for people who want lateral raises with more real doubt. Awesome. That's great. So now I want to talk about your recomp. So I know you did it for three years at around 210 pounds and you saw solid progression getting 18 inch arms. So what do intermediate and advanced lifters get wrong about body recomp? The number one thing and the most essential is time frame. People try to recomp like they bulk or they cut. So they'll do a recomp for four months and say, well, I don't understand. I went nowhere. Well, that's absolutely normal. That's not enough time to see the results of a recomp. Because the recomp is, quote-unquote, the, the worst of both worlds, but also the best of both worlds. Because you're not, going to lose fat as, uh, you're not going to lose fat as fast as with a cut, and you're certainly not going to, to gain mass as fast as with a bulk. But you will still lose fat and gain muscle. It's just going to be much, much slower. And sadly, the average person cannot deal with that. The average person wants results fast. And that's... Okay, but if you go into a recomp with that mentality, you're going to main gain. So you're just going to spin your wheel. Nothing, nothing is going to happen. You really have to give it time. I know that for me, when I was recomping, it felt like I was really just stagnating. But then when I looked at the, the difference in my body composition from the start to the end, I was like, wow, I look like a different person. And actually, I think if you showed that footage to someone, they tell you, oh, he cut. That's a cut. There's no way the guy is the same body weight. But I was the same body weight with extra muscle, because that's also what I loved so much about the recomp. I was exiting a phase of high box where I really couldn't tell if my performance was an increase in muscle or just an increase in mass in general. So it felt really good to stay at the same body weight and see all of my lifts going up. Because to me, that was like a telltale sign that muscle is being built. I cannot magically manufacture strength out of thin air. If I put 100 pounds on a lift, the muscle that is connected to the lift has also grown. Do you feel like uh, you have to be at an appropriate body weight, uh, body fat percentage to recomp effectively over a long period? Yes, because a recomp essentially fuels itself off of your reserves of body fat because it's a trade. You trade that body fat for muscle. So if you start a recomp at 10% body fat, you're not going to go anywhere. You don't have anything to trade for muscle. So this is when you're going to main gain. You're not actually going anywhere. And I think that the sweet spot for people who want to recomp is between 14 and 18% body fat. That is really where you're going to see the best results. I would say that if you're above this, that is also maybe not going to be a great idea because the results are going to be too slow. So maybe cutting down to 18% and then recomping is the best option. Yeah, I think it also depends your development, right? So if you're 17% and you have fully developed abs, that's a very different look than if you're 17% and 
you're still an intermediate lifter, but you've never trained abs before. So I think you need to know where your body's at and if you can be happy recomping long period. It's it's a big commitment to do. It is. And psychologically speaking, you also have to take into account discontent because I've had many people who reach out to me and tell me, hey, should I recomp or should I cut, should I balk? And I tell them, what are you okay with, right? Let's say you're fluffy, you should be cutting. But is this going to impact you? Is this going to make you want to quit the gym because now you're starting to lose size and strength? All of this has to be taken into account. Awesome. So I want to talk about isolation exercises. You've mentioned you use negative reps in reserve, always going to failure and looking to get more so you don't leave any gains on the table. Can you explain this in detail and maybe give some examples that you use? Absolutely. So a question you get a lot is how many reps in reserve should I leave, if any? And my take on this is extremely simple. For lower body count pounds, I personally recommend one to two reps in reserve. So for your heavy squats, your heavy hinges. For the simple reason that these additional reps, yes, they're important, but the risk to reward ratio is not super high. So it's always better to be on the safe side and not do this. We've all been the guy who is grinding a squat, who is grinding a deadlift, you feel cool while you do it, but then the next day you realize, oh, there was fatigue I could have done without. So that's for lower body compounds. Then for upper body compounds, zero to one rep in reserve. So for all of your heavy horizontal presses, vertical presses, you can go to failure if you want, but if you want to stop shy of failure, that's also perfectly fine. Then comes isolation. And isolation is where you just say none of that. No reps in reserve because there's really no point. Isolation movements are single jointed for the most part, so they're extremely safe. As long as you know what you're doing, the range of motion is clean and the exercise selection and the load is proper, you're never going to get hurt. So in that case, you go to failure. Because if you compare a curl and a squat, what happens when you fail a squat? Well, now you have to bail. So hopefully you have safeties or you have to toss the bar behind you. That's not safe. What happens if you fail a curl? Nothing. That's it. That's it. You, you do have a rep. You and then you can <laughs> back and that's it. Nothing happens. So there's no risk involved. And once we accept this, we can also then go for, uh, forward and even further with this, which is to push past failure, which is really nonsensical. There's no past failure. But once you hit that failure or close to failure, you can rest at the top, something like a preacher call, for example, wait maybe 15 to 20 seconds, and you'll find that you'll be able to get additional reps past value that are going to be extremely intense. And these, to me, are the difference maker. Because if you do that every single set, you will see a big difference in progressive overload because you're going to progress faster on lifts that are tough to progress on. And also, these reps are going to really not shock the muscle, but put the muscle in a state where you're going to feel that, okay, something happened, right? You're going to feel not that just the muscle is gorged with blood, but that it has been pushed past, past its limits. Yeah, I completely agree. And I think if you do it for long enough, you feel like if you do a set, you know, to failure without like an intensity technique, like a, a rest pause or you're doing myo reps or something, you almost feel like you were lazy on that set. Even though you did push yourself, it's just you're so used to pushing yourself past that, that you feel lazy on the sets where you, you know, where the average gym goer would be like, you went pretty hard. Yeah. And it, it, that is actually a skill. To develop a lot of people have started to say that recently and i agree with them that going to failure is a skill because when i go to a commercial gym and i look at people the majority of the time it is impossible for me to tell if the person is warming up or if this is a hard set because i see people stop a set their reps haven't slowed down they're not, not even close to failure but the set ends these people will see results as novices and then they're going to crash as intermediates because they won't give their body a reason to grow. Yeah, my pet peeve is when people uh, try to talk to me when I'm doing a set. And in my mind, I'm like, bro, I can't even look at you. Like, I don't know what you want here. Like, I'm, I'm doing my set, but they're able to do that. So it just shows that it's a real lack of intensity if you can you know, do anything while you're doing the set other than focusing on the set. And that is, that is quite telling. It tells you a lot about the way they train because it means that they would be okay with someone talking to them mid-set because it means nothing to them. And, and then you have people on, on their phones. That I will never understand. I see people doing isolation movement, one hand doing the isolation, the other one, their phone. It's crazy. How, I'm, I'm, happy to finish, I'm happy to finish my set and then go on my phone while I rest. Totally yeah, fine. It's fine. But mid-set, insane. 
you know, it's, it is crazy. And the, the sad majority of people are like this. So when then you see the result of that and you say the average person at the gym has a mediocre physique, that to me is not explained by genetics. It's explained just by poor training practices. And I think that really hits home on what's considered like stubborn muscles, because these are the isolation ones typically where you need to push yourself. So if you're doing squats and you're leaving a few in the tank, you can still develop good legs, but you might not develop big arms if you're not pushing your overhead tricep past failure. And that's also an extension to me of the dichotomy between compounds and isolation. Because for the longest time, I've heard people say, oh yeah, compound movements is where you have to be very intense. And isolation, you can take it easy because it's small muscles. But that's completely backwards. It's actually the other way around. A compound forces you to recruit several muscles. You cannot not be intense. It's not possible. By default, the body will have to produce a lot of efforts. So you can actually take it slightly easy on them and put all of your efforts on isolation. Because if you meet someone who tells you oh, a curl isn't intense, this is someone who has never trained curls properly. A curl can be so intense that you start to shake or I sometimes I catch myself drooling when I do isolation movements because I'm so focused that I forget that I have to swallow. <laughs> that's, that's the level of real commitment you can put into an isolation that is not possible in a compound. Agreed, because you can push yourself because the safety is there. Yeah, you know nothing's going to happen, so you can really go both the wall. Awesome. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw out some quotes that you've said in the past. Uh, give me your your first thought on them. Okay. I said uh, all stupid things, so let's see. Oh, I know. <laughs> so the first one is the same water that boils the potato hardens the egg. That is one of my favorite quotes. And funny enough, and funny enough I learned it from a Russian guy who told me it was a Russian proverb. And when I said it on the channel, people in the comments were like, uh, I'm Russian. I've never heard that in my life. <laughs> so I don't know if the guy just made it up. But uh, I really like this proverb because it balances me out. I'm the type of person who's very disciplined, dedicated. When I started training, I was into it from the start. But I also met a lot of people who are not like this. And I got frustrated with them because I thought, well, you're just lazy, right? You're just an asshole. I I'm not going to help you because clearly you don't have what it takes. Then I realized that it's because I might be an egg and they might be a potato. So mm -hmm. when I'm being tossed into boiling water, when I'm being tossed into these harsh environments and this negativity that I like so much, I get better. I harden. But when they get tossed into that, they soften because they're potatoes. It doesn't mean that there's something wrong with them. It just means that you have to treat these people differently. You have to go with a different approach. And <clears throat> this proverb also connects to, and I don't know if you've ever read that manga, Slam Dunk. No. In Slam Dunk, quickly, there are two characters in the same team. It's a basketball show. And one of them is a potato and the other one is an egg. So one of them thrives off of negativity and people telling him you suck so he can get better off of it. And the other one wants to be positively reinforced. He wants compliments. But the issue is that the coach of that team doesn't quite understand that. He thinks that they're both eggs. And so eventually he pushes the other guy to the brink and the guy snaps and punches him. It's a whole thing. But the, the morality and the, 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 the ending of the story is that this guy had potential, even though he was a potato, but he just needed to be treated differently. So once you understand this as a teacher, as an educator, you can best skew your approach to make sure you include as many people as possible because in fitness, we don't want to lose people. Yeah, absolutely. That feels like not just fitness education, but school system education as well. We treat everyone kind of the same when maybe someone has a ton of potential. We're just not using the right modalities for them. And it really expands past that even. It's also something that people say a lot. I think this it's a quote that is given to Einstein. Poor Einstein has so many quotes attributed to him that at some point it's impossible to know what he said. But it's the... if you. If you judge a fish by the ability to climb trees, the fish will think it's stupid for the rest of its life because it's a fish. Mm. It's made to swim. And it's true that in school, sadly, because the system wants a very specific type of citizen, we are all treated the same way. And if you align, great, you're successful and you're rewarded. And if you don't align, you're going to be, to be made to be feel like a failure when in reality, you just need another environment. For sure. I was a very bad student um and then i thrived after school 
And it was just, I needed that freedom. I was kind of a dick to teachers and just my personality, but it worked in other environments. It worked when I was in sales, it worked in business, it worked for personal relationships, but it didn't check the boxes in the school system. It is the tragedy of modern education, at least in the Western world, where we try, we, we want students who are domesticated and who are very obedient. These are the types of behaviors that are rewarded. And so this means that people like you, for example, who are, who are outwilled and who are going to push back against this authority are going to be deemed as somehow not aligning with what is needed. And I had a friend who was exactly like you, who did horribly throughout middle school, high school. Then he went to college with more freedom and ability to express himself creatively. And then he just exploded. He was top of his class, doing amazingly well. And I was the exact opposite. I loved structure. I loved discipline. And people tell me, you do this, you do this. Then I went off to college and I almost flunked out my first year because no one was there to tell me what to do. So I wasn't doing anything. That's funny. All right. Next one here. There are men who are wearing chains, but they think they're free spirits. So I think this was from a, a, a video about Nietzsche. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a whole thing around the idea of freedom and free will. You, maybe you have this experience, I've had, I know, in my life, I've met people who call themselves free spirits, who touted themselves out of their ability to be tolerant and accepting of everyone. And in reality, these were the most intolerant people because they would only accept free spirits that, that fought like them. So as long as you align with what they believe was correct and true and proper morality, then you were okay. And if you didn't, suddenly you are a problem. You became an issue. And to me, that's not freedom. Our absolute freedom of expression should be the ability to understand that people disagree with you and accepting this as an extension of your own freedom. Because if they have it, then you have it. And if you start to fight against their ability to express themselves, one day yours will be taken away from you. And it, it's a level of hypocrisy that I've always detested. To me, to be a free spirit requires not calling yourself a free spirit. So when I lived in the Bay Area and worked at Google, that was my experience. A lot of people were very tolerant and they were free spirits, but it was very clear that you were, they were in a tribe. And if you disagreed with them, you were in, you're on the outside of the tribe. So I found that experience very interesting. Anyone I think who spends enough time in corporate America or in academia, which is even worse, will see that. You meet people who seem to be extremely proud of their ability to be open until you challenge that openness and suddenly everyone turns against you. Yeah, exactly. Okay, the next one is liberty is responsibility. Mm -hmm. That's what I have. I mean, it's not seen, but it's right behind I see it me. there in the corner a little on, bit. Yeah. On the other side. <laughs> so that's a sign that I got my hands on uh, randomly. I knew someone who is a lady in her 60s, 70s, and she had a bunch of these like old memorabilia from 100, 200 years ago. And when I saw this one, I was like, wow, I really like it. And it looked authentic. And it is actually, it's very old. And she gave it to me for Christmas. So that's a nice little gift. Now, the message itself is interesting because we, at least in the modern world, seem to believe that liberty just means no responsibility. Right? I get to do whatever. I get to be disconnected from my duty. To me, that's completely backwards. That's not actually liberty or freedom. That's the absence of it. Because the more freedom you have, the more responsibility you're going to have because the more dangerous you become. Right? Your opportunities have opened up. If you want a people who are as harmless as possible and as domestic domesticated as possible, you restrict their freedom because that way they don't really have options anymore. They're going to behave exactly in the way you want them to behave. Accepting this is important because it means that once you actually obtain that freedom and liberty, you're going to be responsible with it because it's, to me, it's, it's a burden. It's a weight. You can do whatever you want. So think before you do it. Yeah, that's interesting. I like that. I think it, it actually is similar, not similar, but I think it ties into this next one, which is a society where personal responsibility is at the center of everything is going to produce more intelligent and excellent individuals. Yeah, absolutely. Still stand by this one. Uh, another tragedy, I, I believe, uh, for modern times where 
more and more people toss away personal responsibility because they just don't want to have to face the fact that their life is a direct consequence of their actions. And being able to just say, no, no, it's this structure and these people who did this to me is extremely comfortable, sure, because you don't have to face your own failures, but it also means that you're never going to not be a failure because now you have renounced the one factor that would make your life better, which is you. The ability to accept that, yes, fate doesn't exist. Fate is whatever choices that you made. You can look at it from behind and say, okay, well, this happened in the past. That is fate. Well, yes, but fate has your name written on it because that decision came from you directly. I think that at some level, this dissolution of personal responsibility is not just caused by people. It's also caused by systems. I think it's the systems that we go through that try to teach us that we're not responsible because that way we become less capable and we become more dependent on these systems because these systems replace our personal responsibility. So an example, for example, would be the police. The police is absolutely needed, right? We're not going to start doing vigilante justice. But if you have a system where the police is responsible for everything, you end up in craziness. Like countries, for example, my own in France, where people will witness someone getting harassed or attacked, and they will not do anything because they'll say, well, that's not my responsibility. That's the police. Sure, these people are legally correct because they're not going to be prosecuted for not intervening, at least not anymore. But if you look at it from a civilization standpoint, is this really what we want? Is this, do we want a society of people who just stand by and say, not my problem? I think that these people are cowards and I don't personally want to be surrounded by people who think like this. Do you think it's around them thinking it's not their responsibility or because it has not been their responsibility, they've never learned the skill set required to do something? I think it's also both. Uh, the, the majority of people when confronted with a situation that would require the use of violence, freeze because we live in very non-violent societies which is great but it also means that when violent erupts people don't really know what to do because they've never really been trained in these scenarios so that would also be from the start even at the at the school level teaching kids how to engage in these situations how to deal with confrontation the average person the average adult is so petrified of confrontation that whenever conflicts arises they just try to dodge it and it doesn't result in anything positive because then you have quote unquote bad people who absolutely thrive off of confrontation, who just rampage through society and life because no one's going to stop them. Yeah, that's interesting. I also feel like part of responsibility is failure, like failure is part of life and you need to accept that you failed without holding other people accountable. So someone like myself, I view failure in high regard. I view it as a temporary defeat. And then I kind of assess why I failed, whatever it is, hold myself accountable, and then erase it from my memory and try to move on and try to improve myself. But if you never hold yourself accountable and you're never responsible for your failures, how are you going to improve? Why would you improve? And that's a big difference between, between people who progress and people who stagnate. When you meet someone in your life, a system or institution who tries to take away your failure, the first instinct would be to be thankful, maybe thinking, oh, you're taking this negativity away from me. Thank you. But in reality, these people are stealing away your potential because that failure would be something you could reflect on to get better. So they keep you stuck. And accepting this is hard for many people because letting go of that comfort of donating failure onto someone else is hard. Yeah, and you can see that at a system level, right? So something when I grew up in sports, there was winners and losers. And that was okay. And now we live in this world where everyone gets a participation badge. So that's a system where now kids are growing up where they didn't lose. Everyone won. And there's there's some benefit in in actually winning and actually losing and actually learning from that. But that's been taken away from us. And I know that a lot of people like to push back because they consider this boomer talk, this idea of, oh, back in my days, there was no I'm a boomer. trophy. Okay. <laughs> I mean, to, to a certain degree, I understand that, that it's annoying to hear the same pontiffs repeated times and times again, but there's a truth in this. We are, in a sense, keeping people into childhood. We keep people kids for way too long now because you meet people who in their 20s, for example, have never experienced defeat, 
they've never experienced adversity. But the problem is that this cannot last forever. At some point or the other, real life is going to find you. And if it finds you in your 20s, when you've never met it before, it's going to be impossible to deal with because you weren't prepared. These small failures, these small defeats and victories that you accumulate throughout childhood, they prepare you for what is to come. They're like filters. You grow through them. So once you become an adult, you're ready. I see a lot of people my age who their favorite thing is to complain about being an adult. They say, oh, I, I wish I could be a kid or adulthood wasn't all that I was promised it was. It's too hard. Uh, this life is not worth it. I know where these people came from. These are not people who have difficult lives. It's actually the exact opposite. Their lives were way too easy. And adulthood, young, actually speaks of adulthood in these terms. That's when you can no longer be carefree. You are no longer allowed to be carefree. And it's hard, of course, but it's needed. Society needs a portion of people, children, to have no responsibility whatsoever, and another portion, adults, to carry all of the responsibility. What happens in a society where the adults start to refuse that responsibility? I think that's a society that is going to either start to force the kids to grow up too fast or that is going to collapse. Awesome. I'm going to move this quote into a completely different direction. We'll go back to the fitness side of things. I know we're getting really deep here. So uh, abs really are the centerpiece of the physique. They're in the middle of the physique. So it's where the eyes go. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it's logical. But a lot of people seem to have forgotten that because I see a lot of natural bodybuilders who have excellent physiques, excellent levels of muscularity. Then you look at their core and even when they're very lean, it's just flat. So they don't have the definition. They don't have like the separation between the obliques and the abs. And to me, that's just, a, it's a shame because it ruins everything else. When you go from body part to body part and you look at a bodybuilder, for example, you don't jump from the forearm to the quad, right? Your eyes don't have that ability. They travel. And when they travel, they always meet the same thing, which is the middle section. And that's the core. So people always look at your abs. If you don't train them, to me, you're just sabotaging your aesthetics for no reason. I agree. And it also allows you to be aesthetic at a higher body fat percentage, which I think has uh, advantages for people who are not trying to be social media influencers or bodybuilders. Like there's advantages in being able to eat more food and be a little more free. Mm -hmm. And even if we go into the domain of function, Having abs, I mean, abs are part of the core with the lower back, right? It's not enough to have a strong lower back. If the abs are weak, then you have an imbalance. So training your abs through flexion also means that you're going to be healthier longer. Absolutely. So the next one is, you know, those dudes who dip one toe into the pool of exercise science and suddenly that's all they can talk about and they lose focus on what's most important, which is the training. So I'm on a bit of a crusade against exercise science and science-based lifting. And some people might misconstrue this as thinking that I'm against science, which I'm not. I'm perfectly fine with science as long as it's applied properly. And there are a lot of people on this platform who I think make a good use of exercise science. But it's impossible to deny that you also have a lot of people who use it as a gimmick because they figured out that when you put science-based in your title, you could essentially put proven by God in the title, and it would be the same thing. Because science is the new God in the eyes of many people, meaning it's a creature whose mouth produces truth. If someone is a prophet of that creature, they must be right. That is absolute nonsense, of course, but this is how the majority of people seem to think. So then, naturally, you also have a ton of people who are going to think, okay, as long as I train following scientific principles, then I'm going to maximize my results. What they fail to understand is that that one, might not be true because studies change all the time. And two, you should have started with the training. Once you have the training and the experience that you build for your own body, then you can start to refine by looking at studies. But if you do it the other way around, what I've seen happen times and times again is people who just get paralyzed because science changes all the time and they always want to be optimal. But the most optimal training is the one that you do. It's something that I say all the time on the channel, but it's true. You will get outdone by a guy who goes to the park with a backpack full of rocks who does push-ups and, and pull-ups. Your program can be as optimal as you want if you do it once or twice a week and you don't go when it's raining or when you're tired or when you don't feel like it. It's never going to produce anything. It, it, it's only as valuable as what you put into it. 
Then there are small differences in percentages of results that you will get if an exercise is better suited for hypertrophy or not. But you can start worrying about that later. Yeah, absolutely. When I first started lifting, uh, I guess it was like our gym coach. He was like, get the easy curl, curl bar and do seven, seven, seven. Do seven half reps at the bottom, seven half reps at the top, and then seven full reps. And do as many sets as you can of those. So there's no exercise science. And we all saw gains from it because we ended up pushing ourselves really hard with high reps and high volume. And I feel like doing, I don't want to say doing the basics, but learning how to lift on your own while potentially using some things being optimal is fine. But if you're doing excessive range of, ranges of motion and you're looking at every study and you are not a critical thinker, you're going to fail. And I think the, the example you just gave is perfect because a real issue with science-based influencers is that they take practices that are okay for advanced lifters and they push it onto noobs. So when you tell people, oh, do four range of motion with a low tempo and you tell that to an advanced lifter, that guy is going to still select a load that will take him to failure and he's still going to be intense, but a noob won't. Because now there are too many variables. The noob is now going to be hyper-focused on, okay, stretching as much as possible, one, two, three tempo, and this thing and that thing. And then you end up seeing people who do rows with 20 pounds. You can do rows as many times as you want with 20 pounds. I don't care about range of motion. You will not grow from this. So it's really an issue of priority. The prioritization is simply not right. And to take a look at also your easy curl bar example, that's great because as a novice, that is perfectly fine. You will grow from this, but as an advanced lifter, you won't. So this would be the time where you realize, okay, I need a rep range, I need a weight, I need a tempo. Only then. Yeah, I think the one I see that to me is detrimental to novice lifters is these really long setup times where they're moving the bench over to the cable station and they're trying, like, th they spend 15 minutes doing the setup and then they're only in the gym for 40 minutes. Like, be more productive during that time instead of trying to be optimal for this one exercise. That is even a criteria that I apply in my training and I'm advanced. There are certain lists that I know are good, but the setup is so annoying that I just don't do them because I could do something else instead that would be faster and maybe 2% less effective, but who cares? Because the ability to get in and get out is super important. And that is also something that influencers, advanced influencers tend to forget. They think that everyone has their entire day to train. But the average, the average person goes to school, they have a job, they have maybe an hour to 45 minutes to train. You have to get them in and get them out, which is why I love supersets so much. Supersets might be slightly less effective for performance, even though I personally disagree. But they also cut your workout times in two. Because now instead of doing one exercise, rest three minutes, one exercise, etc., you can just do one, two, rest, one, two, rest, and then you're done. Absolutely. So something you talk about is how the spiritual and mind is 50%. What do you think people get wrong about visualization and having a worthy ideal when they're trying to achieve greatness? So with spirituality and fitness, when you start talking about it, you'll have two responses. Here are people who tell you that's useless. This is not proven by science. It's woo-woo bullshit. You're a hippie. Or you have people who are already bought into the idea and they'll love whatever you have to say, which is too bad because I don't have to convince these people. They already know. What I want to convince is the bros who think that the mind for some reason has no impact on the body. I have found personally that the natural lifters who keep progressing and keep growing are the ones who have bought into the idea that they will keep growing. On the flip side, I've met people who still train hard, still push themselves, but they have believed, they have bought into the belief that they're done and they are done. Their, their body no longer grows. And that can be a mind over matter. That is a possibility. It could also be explained psychologically. If you don't believe in what you're doing, you're not going to push yourself as much as you think you are. You're going to take rest days here and there because you think I'm done. So why would you push yourself? This is why I insist so much that it's great to build the body. But the reason why most people stall at some point is not the body. It's that the mind that directs the body has given up. Yeah. And sometimes I wonder with myself if it's like success bias because it's happened in the past. But I know when I did my initial fat loss journey, I had a very clear goal, be X weight and X body fat and maintain it for X years. 
and that vision was very clear. And as the vision became more clear, I needed less and less motivation because it felt like it was a matter of fact and it was just going to happen. So I definitely believe in that. But then there's a part of me that wonders, like, do I just think this because, uh, you know, there's some survivor bias and I happen to be part of that. Survivor bias is interesting because it connects back to what we said about the egg and the potato. Survivor bias might be an issue because it's going to skew you through cognitive dissonance. And you'll think that anyone and everyone can achieve what you achieve with the same method. So that's the negative part. But then you have the positive part. If you're going to take advice from someone, who do you want to take advice from? The survivor. You don't want to take advice from the guy who drowned. So the people who have survivor bias are also always going to be put in a position where they can pull people out of the water. And some people will be pulled out, some people won't. You have to accept this as a fitness influencer. You cannot, you cannot mastermind people into success. The best you can do is give them the keys if they want to open the door. Cool. If they don't, too bad. Absolutely. And uh, like there's this Steve Jobs quote, which is you can only connect the dots looking backwards. So I feel like everyone's journey is still going to be different, but you can give them the tools. Yeah. And the great thing too is that once they have their own journey, then they can turn around and help other people connect the dots. That is really what I like so much about this community where I help people, they grow, and they help people. And this is how we get a healthier, bigger, and stronger community. Absolutely. Okay. Now I'm going to move to kind of a fun question. What is your Mount Rushmore, your four favorite exercises that people should be doing, but they're not? Okay. So, so that people should be doing, but they're not. So it's stuff that's exotic. Well, I'll start with the pullover. I, I have never once seen someone do a pullover in a commercial gym. Not once. Never. Never once. One time I saw a girl set up on a bench with a dumbbell. And I was like, she's going to do pullovers. So I was excited. And then she was she did some like glute thrust with the dumbbell on her hips. So I was like very disappointed afterwards. But yeah, pullovers. Pullovers done properly when you walk your way through the range of motion. Once you start to load, you will see amazing results in your lats, in your thoracic extension, in your shoulder health, in your long head of the tricep, in your chest. It really is the most underrated compound movement of all time that has been completely taken out of programs for some reason. And I think that the reason is, one, that people have started to say that it's a bad exercise using dubious reasons at best. Usually people who have never trained pullovers, which usually is not a good sign, considering that they have never had the experience of the lift. Uh, it might also be because it's true that when you get into pullovers at the start, they can feel awkward, your neck might cramp, you don't have the range of motion, so you don't feel your lats, and that discourages people. But this is one of those lifts where if you put in the time, it is going to reward you. So that's my number one. Second exercise that I think is underrated, I would pick a forearm exercise, but not any forearm exercise. I would pick a pronation twist. So if you look at most people who train forearms, they're going to do it in the same axis of movement while their wrist remains static. So an arm curl, for example. Okay. That is perfectly fine. It's a great exercise. But they fail to take into account that the forearm and the musculature of the forearm also responds positively to wrist movements. So stuff like actively pronating into a movement. So you do this as you go up or supinating into a movement. The supination is something that people train because a lot of the time, you you end up finding out that you're stronger on the negative when you supinate your arm. So it, it happens by default. But the other way around, I rarely see people who do this. And that's a shame because it's very easy to set up. You just grab, not necessarily a dumbbell, but a loop. You can put around your hand like this, and you tie it to a weight that dangle here. And you're going to do your curls in that fashion. And this pronation is really going to blow up your forearm. The reason why, when you look at arm wrestlers, the majority of them, even the natural ones, tend to have incredible form measurements, sometimes even bigger than their upper arm, is because their wrist is always moving, because that's part of their sport. You can replicate that as a bodybuilder. You don't actually have to arm wrestle. So that's another thing that I would say more people need to do, if only for the sensation. It really actually feels tremendous on the forearm. I've never done it, so I'll, I'll do that. You should give it a try. And you can do it on cables, you can do it with a, a pin stack where you just put plates. It's extremely versatile, even if you have a home gym. Number three. Number three, I would pick something that I've started doing recently for calves. 
for a long, long time, I was only training my calves through weightlifting exercises, so calf raises, which is absolutely fine, and you all grow from this. But I've always felt that I was lacking in volume because when I looked at the total amount of reps I was getting, I was getting 40 to 50 reps per session. And when you think about it, your calves get thousands, tens of thousands of reps every day because you walk on them. Let's say you do 10K steps a day, 10K steps compared to 50 reps. Even if you load the 50 reps, the total amount of volume is not, the discrepancy is not enough. So I was trying to figure out a way to get a lot of steps in while being very intense at the same time. And this is when I started doing something on the Stair Masters. So the Stair Masters in the gym is a great tool for cardio, but it's also a great tool for calves. What I do is I take a backpack and I put kettlebells in the backpack. I'm right now using 55-pound kettlebell, kettlebells. I go on to the Stair Master with my backpack and I do 10 minutes at a moderately fast pace, not super fast, and I do them on my tippy toes. Okay. So I'm only allowed to put my foot on the last end of the stair. And that is horribly intense. I've never felt a sensation like that in my calves before from calf raises. And two, it's a lot of volume. Because when I look at the end of the 10 minutes, usually I've went up 25 to 30 flights of stairs. Because the stair master counts how many flights you go up to. So that's a lot of reps. And that has been the key I was missing for my calf growth. Because I'm really starting to see great results from doing both. And I insist on both. You can't just do one. You have to have this plus the heavy resistance training. And that seems to really unlock an hypertrophy response. And for people who are interested, start with one time a week. And then you can go up to two times a week. It's horribly hard. I'll be honest. It's not something you're going to look forward to, but it does work. And then fourth. So we've done forearms. We've done calves. We've done pullovers. I would say neck. I've also never seen people train neck in a commercial gym. Uh, it's been ridiculed for a very long time, which is a shame because it's one of the muscles that makes you the most aesthetic. People see your neck because they look at your face. Mm -hmm. And also, it might be the difference between life and death. Recently, I had a subscriber send me a message telling me, hey, a year and a half ago, I cut the video you made on neck training where I told people, train your neck because it might save your life. And the guy got into a car accident recently and he got T-boned. And once he went to the hospital, the doctor told him, wow, you have nothing. You don't even have contusions in your neck. Usually people snap their vertebra from something like this because of the force of the car slamming into you from the side. The guy was fine. So, of course, it could just be chance or luck. But the dude told me, hey, I had been training neck for a year and a half. And I'm 100% certain that this really helped. So, to me, if you're not training neck, you should start. Absolutely. I want to see a title, Natural Hypertrophy, Saving Lives, Science-Based. <laughs> 200,000 views in a day. <laughs> um, that's awesome. And with the calves too, like I found that, you know, a lot of uh, people who do hypertrophy have trouble developing the calves. I haven't had that problem. And I think it's because I play a lot of tennis and basketball and sports where you're always running, stopping, going on your tippy toes, jumping. So I think you do need that kind of more endurance uh, component as well. Yeah, yeah. it'll also get bros to some cardio. If we can get some bros to do go on a hike once in a while, that is also going to even help with connection with nature and that makes you happier. So it's a double benefit. Awesome. Um, so I want to talk about something a little interesting. Um, there's this thing called like the Russian art of clowning. It's not like what you see with clowns in America. It's really real and heartfelt. Having kind of a, a mask allows them to give performances and being liberated to give their deepest essence on the stage. Does this resonate with you at all um, as someone who chooses to remain anonymous? Hmm. So it's a question about masks. Yeah. Well, for me, it's a bit different because I wear a mask in my everyday life. because. I have found with experience that my real me doesn't really sit well with people. So people, for example, who say, well, I love honesty, that they meet me and I'm honest with them. Suddenly they don't like it so much. So, and it's something that my wife tells me all the time where she's like, hey, you have to like tone it down with these people because I've had remarks that you're too aggressive or you're too like upfront with people. I've always been like this because it's the way I want people to treat me. 
I cannot stand passive aggressiveness. I cannot stand people who are not direct. Tell me what you want. That way we can engage like adults. The problem is that you can't live like this. So in every life, I have a mask where I'm, my voice gets higher and I'm much more polite and I'm, I, I play a game. I play the game of social life. Um, but on my channel, I don't have to do that. So on my channel is the one place where I'm actually myself. People who watch my channel might know me better than some people in my actual day-to-day -day life because they get to see me unfiltered. And that's yes, something like, that I really like. So I think the art of clowning is the same thing where they're able to be their, their real self when they're on the stage, at least, as opposed to in their day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, that's, that's so interesting because you would think it would be the opposite, right? It's an act. And in truth, when you look at social media, you see a lot of people who are putting on, putting on an act where you can tell it's not really who they are. But there's always a reason behind it, right? People don't put, up, put on masks for free. They do it because there's a benefit for them. Maybe because this mask makes them very popular or it makes them money. Yeah. I'm in a position, luckily, where I don't have to worry about these things. Awesome. I'm going to ask you a, a tough question. I want to imagine you're 80 years old, looking back on your life, what would you want your legacy to be? If I can go to my grave knowing I helped people, then that is all I really need. And I don't care if my name is remembered. I don't really care if I have statues of myself around the world. That doesn't matter. What I want is my impact to be long lasting. And I want people five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now to think, oh, I remember that one video of natural hypertrophy and that really changed me that really allowed me to like make a positive change that's what i want awesome that's great and i guess that definitely relates to your type of content because for some person it might be like a training specific video and for someone else it might be a mindset philosophical type of video right it's hard to know what has impact to someone because you have to find Sometimes we talked about like an exercise clicking earlier, but sometimes a concept has to be there at the right time and get you in the right way. And then it clicks and then it's there forever. And, and it's hard as a educator to know, am I doing that? When am I doing that? You're in control of this. You know, when you put out a video, once it's released, the reception is up to the audience. Sometimes you have videos that come out at the right time. And they hit perfectly. And sometimes you have videos who just fizzle out because that was not the right time. Yeah. Awesome. So usually I do a segment where I put images of YouTubers on and say what you want to work out with them. I'm not going to do that for you because you mentioned repeatedly that you only want to work out alone. So I've decided to kind of go super meta. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to throw up pictures of your younger self. And I want to, you to imagine that you can meet this version and what's one piece of advice that you would give them. And also maybe what's one thing that person was doing well that you could learn from. Okay. Oh, I know it's super meta. All right. So this is uh, NH who's been working at his arms. Yep. Yeah. yeah. That's a kid that thinks he's real cool. I remember going around in this like uh, this tank top thinking, damn, I'm big as fuck. And actually, I sort of miss this time period of my life because I had reverse body dysmorphia. So back then, I really thought I was huge. Like In my head, I was a tank. And I'm now maybe 50 pounds heavier than this. And I don't think like this at all anymore. So that's what this guy had on me. He was much more confident in his own body in that way, in this delusional way. And one thing I would tell him is, don't base your standards of excellence off of other people because other people are mediocre. Just disregard all of this and just keep doing your best because this was right before I started to go into a quote-unquote depression in my life because I didn't feel challenged by my environment. I didn't feel challenged by people, adults. And so I, instead of just saying, fuck it, they suck, I just lowered myself to their standards and that was a mistake. I've done that as well. I think it's pretty natural when you're young to want acceptance from the people around you. And if their standards are low, you kind of put your standards there. All right. Next one here is uh, NH who is eating too many meatball subs at Subway. So that's big boy fat NH. And I love that picture so much because everything like... In French. Everything is wrong with this picture. <laughs> you start at the, the shorts. What are these shorts? 
what are, like they are the horribly misshapen there's this weird parallel bar above my knees what even is this then you have the shirt i still have that shirt i still rock that shirt i look good in that shirt here you can still see my guts through the shirt and that's not okay because it's a double xl so that shouldn't be possible and then you look at the face i look like a toad and the funniest thing too is that it's a bit of a bragging moment i was actually very popular with girls back then and i don't understand how because when i look like this i didn't see myself as fat but now that i look at it i'm like yeah you're definitely like that's fat 100 fat how did girls find this attractive this is when i met my wife and she found me gorgeous like this so i don't i do not get it i really don't i'm glad i no longer look like this um so that's that's all of the mistakes that this guy did and then the good things I don't know. Honestly, I didn't do much properly then. Maybe go to museums because that's a museum. Okay, fair enough. Uh, next one is NH with the really cool Pokemon shirt. So we'll start with the shirts. Um, I'm now almost in my 30s and I know that I'm supposed to enter an age where you're no longer supposed to wear that type of t-shirt and you're supposed to wear like polos and nice dress shirts. I don't want to. I really like shirts like this. And if I still had that shirt, I would wear it. Unfortunately, I don't think I fit it anymore. But that was um, that was what this guy was doing well. He didn't care about what people think. And I still don't. I will wear whatever I want. One of my favorite pieces of clothing is a fanny pack with cats on it. I wear it every time I'm outside. And you should see the looks of people where they're like, they see this big dude walking around with a fanny pack with cats. It's hilarious. And then what this, this guy wasn't doing well, I think I had a lot of, a lot of fake confidence back then mm. where I, re, I, I was trying to, to fake it till I make it. And that didn't really work. I found that I had to let go of all of this fake confidence to build real confidence. Awesome. And uh, fact or fiction, you tried to evolve a magic carp into a Mew. I did. How do you know that? Don't worry. Don't worry about it. Yeah. I mean, I think all every kid did because, of course, I had a friend who told me, oh, if you put a magic carp into the pension, as we say in French, and you wait for it to turn level 100, which takes a lot of time and money, and you beat the Elite Four, I think it was like 50 times, then you come back and it's a Mew. Of course, I came back. I had a, one, I, I had a level 100 magic carp that couldn't evolve. You actually did it. Of course I did it. That's a lot of work because he only has like splash. Well, I mean, in, in the pension, he doesn't have to fight. He's uh, leveling up just by default. But then you have to pay for every level. So it was very expensive. Yeah, fair enough. I still, I have a Pokemon shirt and I wear it. So, okay, and I wear polos as well, but I wear like my basketball shirts. I wear my Pokemon. Like it's a mix. Sometimes you wear the... You can't take the kid out of you. You know what I mean? No, it's you have there. to maintain a sense of whimsy. All right, and the last one here is day one YouTube NH. In the old school garage gym. Yep, there is a reason why this picture was taken at Nipo level. It's because that part of the body looked good, but then when you looked underneath, not so good. But I still look fondly to, this, to these days, and I still look pretty good in these pictures, actually. So, yeah, what this guy was doing well, starting a, fit, a fitness channel. Mm -hmm. I think that the mistake that many people make is they wait for this impossible series of events to start sharing. Don't wait. Start today. You should have started tomorrow. There's no right time. F social media is, is what you make of it. If you want to share things and teach people, just start. It's, don't even think about it twice. Just do it. And then you'll figure it out as you go. When I started, I had no idea what I was doing. I still don't to some level. And then what this guy was doing poorly, I was still in the powerlifting dogma back then. I was still not really focusing on what matters for bodybuilding at least. And I think that my channel actually helped me figure it out. Yeah, that's awesome. And I agree. If you want to start a channel, just start it. Like I only started recently, but my first video had a had no mic, no camera. I could have bought it. And I said, I just want to start today. So I'm going to start today and then I can always improve that yeah. type of stuff over time. Awesome. NH, thanks so much for your time today. Uh, where can everyone find you? So the main source of content is always going to be YouTube. 
I try to put one to two videos out a week. It's fitness, but I also make videos about philosophy. So you might be sometimes surprised by like a two hour segment on something completely unrelated. It's, it's part of the process, right? A lot of people end up finding out that they like these videos better than the fitness stuff. So that's for where I make my stuff. And then I have an Instagram that is really useless. I just post random pictures with captions that I find funny. There's nothing serious on it. If you want to see pictures of myself shirtless or like swimming or whatever, that's where you can find me. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time, man. I appreciate it.